you how the plan to take down Obamacare this week just hit a big snag in the Senate. We need to have replacement the same day we repeal Obamacare. Meanwhile, Congress considers tougher ways to punish Vladimir Putin while the president-elect seeks a better relationship. I don't think it's all that unusual for a new president to want to get along with the Russians. And we have a bruising fight over Trump's cabinet picks that's just getting started with another dust-up tonight over ethics rules on Capitol Hill. Plus, on the biggest night of college football, we'll dig into the stadium debate in Tampa Bay and the future of the Rays in Tropicana Field. John Wilson is back with his view. The center of the marketplace is where you want to be, and it's not St. Petersburg. The center of the marketplace is indeed Tampa. This is Money, Power, and Politics. Okay, we're going to start with a rush to confirm Mr. Trump's cabinet. Key nominees have not yet filled out the paperwork to ensure they don't have conflicts of interest, but Senate leaders say they can deal with that after the hearings. And the American people has a, have a right to know if they're going to be entering into those offices with conflicts of interest. Ethics watchdogs say Trump's nominees have not gone through the full background checks, have not filled out the financial and ethics disclosures that are required, and may have some unknown or unresolved conflicts of interest. So why haven't they filled out those papers by now? Well, like Trump, many of his picks come from the business world, where they have complex business dealings that take a while to disclose. And the Senate has already lined them up in a blitz of hearings this week. I'm optimistic that we'll be able to get up to seven nominees on day one, just like we did eight years ago. Well, protesters have gathered saying the nominees must be vetted and that ethics reviews must be completed. But Democrats appear to have little power to hold up the nominations. The Democrats changed the rules a couple of years ago, allowing nominees to get approved by a simple majority. And Republicans now have that majority. That means Trump's nominees will likely get confirmed, but they will get bruised up along the way. And Jeff Sessions, Trump's pick to run the Justice Department, is already taking some of the hardest hits. But Sessions' immoral record shows consistent support for ideological extremism, racist and classist policies, and writing, the writing of discrimination into the law. Some of his advisors say he just has a different political ideology, but they need to add that he has a different racist political ideology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it begins. Senate Democrats, by the way, cannot stop the hearings, but they can try to slow them down. And Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer said he will hit the brakes if the nominees have not been fully vetted. Meanwhile, Republican leaders plan to dismantle Obamacare this week, but that may take much longer than they had hoped. We could put a good budget forward, we could repeal Obamacare, and we could put forward replacement the same day. I can't guarantee there will be, but I'm telling everybody in my caucus, and I'm trying to tell the country, we need to have replacement the same day we repeal Obamacare. Rand Paul may have just thrown a big wrench into plans to take down Obamacare this week. In this interview, he insisted that it must be replaced with a new system on the same day they repeal the law as we know it today. And after that interview, he said President-elect Trump called him to support and agree with that, which puts Republicans in a bind because they had the votes to repeal right now, but don't have the replacement fully figured out. It would be ideal if we could do it all in one big action. But look, it may take time to get all the elements of the replace in, in place. Meanwhile, hospitals are sounding alarms because repealing the Affordable Care Act could cost hospitals more than $160 billion. And with a weaker than expected jobs report last month, there are growing concerns that scrapping Obamacare without replacing it right away could ding our economy. And Democrats are running with that. As I've said to you before, repeal and replace has only alliteration going for it. It has no votes. It has no ideas. It has no proposal. Uh, and uh, so we'll be interested to see how they want to replace. Vice President-elect Mike Pence said the goal is to pass a bill by February 20th. President-elect Trump said he's not even a little bit worried about how Republicans will replace Obamacare. President Obama said he's okay with something new, again, putting pressure on Republicans to create something new before they scrap his biggest legislative achievement. It may be called something else. I, and, and as I said, I, I, don't, I don't mind. If, in fact, the Republicans make some modifications and relabel it as Trump care, I'm fine with that. And that's just the start. While this fight over Obamacare and Trump's cabinet picks heat up, Congress also is getting the unclassified version of the intelligence reports on Russian hacking. 
and they now have to decide how to respond while President-elect Trump seeks better relations with Vladimir Putin. I don't think it's all that unusual for a new president to want to get along with the Russians. That's not exactly how Reagan approached the Russians or Soviets when he took office. They are the focus of evil in the modern world. Reagan took a hardline stance before he negotiated with Gorbachev. But if history teaches anything, it teaches that simple-minded appeasement or wishful thinking about our adversaries is folly. It means the betrayal of our past, the squandering of our freedom. George W. Bush did express optimism with Putin at first. Remember, Bush said he looked into Putin's eyes and saw his soul. But the next Republican nominee saw something very different. We need to realize who we are dealing with here, an old KGB colonel. What is going on in Russia is outrageous. The repression uh, and even killing of some dissidents uh, is rampant. They are total violators of human rights. Then the next Republican nominee, Mitt Romney, said our biggest geopolitical threat is Russia. And now our intelligence community says Russia and Putin deliberately interfered in our election. And while President-elect Trump pushed back on that for weeks, Democrats and Republican leaders in Congress agree that Russia did interfere in the election to try to help Mr. Trump. I accept the, uh, uh, what the intelligence community has unanimously agreed to that they were trying to affect the election? No doubt in my mind that Russians interfered, that John Podesta's emails were hacked by the Russians, not some 14-year-old kid or 300-pound guy, and that the DNC was compromised by the Russians. It's pretty obvious that they were heavily engaged, and we need to come to grips with it and get to the bottom of it. And when press, even Trump's own chief of staff said, yes, Russia did interfere. The primary actor is the foreign entity that's perpetrating the crime to begin with. Which was. No doubt about it, which Chris. Was, I'm not denying that. Which was. I, I'm not denying it. I'm not denying but, but, it. And what was but that what foreign I'm entity? is Russia. And with that, Congress and the president-elect must now decide how to respond. To what extent will Congress seek to punish Russia more? And how will Trump pivot after encouraging Russian hackers to hurt Hillary Clinton during the campaign? Russia, if you're listening... I hope you're able to find the 30,000 emails that are missing. I think you will probably be rewarded mightily by our press. The new administration also has to explain why Trump still wants a good relationship with Putin. If our country got along with Russia, that would be a great thing. I don't think there's anything wrong with trying to have a good relationship with Russia and other countries around the world. That's what he wants to do, and I think that's what he will do. And Priebus also said the president-elect at this point has accepted the conclusions of the intelligence report and the intelligence community, but he insists that Russian meddling did not swing the election, and he still wants to improve relations with Russia to help us fight and win the war on terror. All right, we've got a lot of ground to cover as Raymond James hosts the college football championship. We'll drill into the stadium debate on the other side of the bay. What's next for Tropicana Field and the Rays? Where should they move? What should we pay? John Wilson is back with his view after the break. Well, tonight, Tampa Bay hosted the biggest night of the year in college football. There is no debate about that. But there is a debate across the bay over what to do with the Rays in Tropicana Field. So tonight, we're going to take a look at the options. What would a new stadium or dome look like? What might it cost? And of course, where will it be? John Wilson will weigh in with his view. But first, the Rays have some thoughts, and the team is asking for your ideas. Here's a snippet from the Ballpark Reimagined website. We are building a destination that enhances our community. And will bring us together for generations to come. An icon as distinct as we are. This is John Wilson's My View Now. All right, here he is once again, John Wilson. Thank you for joining me yet again. Okay, what's the deal with the Rays? If the Rays move outside of St. Petersburg, say into Tampa, are their attendance numbers going to go up? Well, that's the hope. That's the whole reason we have this discussion, isn't it? Because they are among the worst attended teams in the entire Major League Baseball. So the attendance is horrible. Uh, 
But you have to say this when you talk about attendance of the Rays. The Rays fans are loyal. They are diehard fans. The problem is there aren't enough of them. That's the issue by comparison with other teams. So we need to get past this. The stadium, a lot of people love that stadium. But everybody else who, who doesn't live here, they criticize that stadium. They call it, what do they call it? They, they, they call it a nightmare. The nightmare in St. Petersburg has got to end. They need a new stadium. Was well, it going to be in downtown St. Petersburg? I don't think so. I think it's going to be somewhere between Pinellas County and Hillsborough County, and it could be in Hillsborough or in Pinellas. But it's, I think it's going to move. Something we have not seen with the Rays in its history, sustained winning. Yes, they made it to the series. No way. They've had some good seasons here and there, but they've been up and down. They haven't sustained it. If they That's win correct. on a consistent basis, do you think the trop would fill? The answer is yes. I think yes. I think they do support a winning team. The Bucks, Bucks will show you that. When they're winning, Stadium is doing good. When they're not winning, it's really down. Yes. Attendance collapses. But you have to have a winning team. Now, as you point out, we had a winning team. We yes. won at that championship in the American League. Yes. We went on three other years to finish in, in top positions. Yes. What happened? Team began to come apart internally. Players, performance, attendance down, winnings down. It, this town, see, you're asking. And so, see, it is not unique. It, this is not no, unique. Look, no. Atlanta was the team of the 1990s. They sold out a lot of games because of it, made an awful lot of money. But this year, there's not so many fans, and it goes back to winning. If the Rays just, by gosh, won. Got to win. You, you, yeah. you, have to, you have to win. The, the other thing about, about this issue here is that, and it, this is the part the public hates, is that we as taxpayers are being asked to pay for the stadium, and we've done it public has paid for it many times yes. over in many other cities. This is one of those places. Stuart Sundberg is asking for, for help with, and he'll commit, he says, up to a third, I think. Is that mm -hmm. what you remember? Yes. Up to a third of the cost. We're talking a third of $600 million. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's, that's not chump change. No. And not now, not at this time, and not for the city of St. Petersburg or Pinellas County or Tampa Bay when people are, have difficulty getting to that stadium in downtown St. Pete. Remember what George Steinbrenner said when that stadium was built? You have to build it where, where Tampa can see it. <laughs> he yeah. wanted it in Pinellas County, somewhere around the Carolot. Well, that may be where it winds up, somewhere up there. Or Hillsborough's moving ahead, as you know, with, uh, yep. with, with, uh, with taxes, and they are going to put in $30 million right off the top with sales tax money and tourist tax money. They're moving ahead with plans to, to put in a competitive bid here. Let me push you. Where is the best place, in your opinion, having lived in St. Pete for decades, for this stadium to go? Having lived in St. Pete and having worked in Tampa, um, the center of the marketplace is where you want to be, and it's not St. Petersburg. The center of the marketplace is indeed Tampa, is around Tampa, Some, not way out to the fairgrounds. That's, but we're talking about downtown Tampa, somewhere between Landmark and uh, or the Channel and West Shore, somewhere in there. John, thank you for your insight. <laughs> okay. Okay, please check out our YouTube channel for more My View segments, commentary segments from John Wilson and others. Search for Craig Patrick's Money, Power, and Politics and click subscribe at the top of the page. John also weighs in on Mr. Trump, the election, so much more. You'll also find our investigations of wasted money in state and federal government as well as our parody and humor segments. Meanwhile, we've got a long way to go. The Catholic Church in Tampa Bay lost a legend last year, and John Wilson will stick around to share some stories with him I have never heard before after the break. Well, the Catholic Church here in Tampa Bay is going through some changes. We'll start with Bishop Lynch. He retired, and Bishop Gregory Parks succeeded him as the new bishop of the Diocese of St. Petersburg. It's a bit of a homecoming as the new bishop is from Tampa, and we've invited him to sit down with us when his schedule permits. Meanwhile, the diocese lost an impactful leader last year with the passing of Monsignor Lawrence Higgins. And so before we look ahead, we want to take a look back at Higgins legacy because our special guest, John Wilson, has some interesting perspective here. You have some stories and some insights about this man and what he brought to our community that I had not heard. I'm really glad you brought this up because Monsignor Higgins was, was a truly unique individual. He was uh, with us almost 60 years. He was 29 when he came here from Northern Ireland outside Belfast, and that Irish accent he had was, was part of it. It really made it, really made it 
possible for him to be far more ecumenical, I think, than any other Catholic priest or any other non-Catholic priest that I have ever seen in my life because he could talk to everybody. Everybody, the high and mighty and the meek and lowly. Monsignor Higgins was there to the Boys and Girls Clubs, to sports clubs. He was, on a, he was on a sports team in his youth that he won a national championship. He was a soccer player. But the one that jumped out at me, the story that got me, was when, when he was in Havana, Cuba, and Fidel Castro, he asked, this is how Monsignor Higgins was. He went up to Fidel Castro and asked him, may I say a prayer for you? you imagine that, going up to Castro. Well, Castro said yes and agreed to the prayer. Well, he got something of a confession out of him there, to which I asked Monsignor Higgins later, what did he say? He said, I can't tell you that. <laughs> so we don't, we don't. Only Monsignor took that with him. Uh, but he had that moment with Fidel Castro that was extraordinary. And it kind of gave us hope that, that there's, there's life in that man still yet. And he touched the lives of thousands, countless people in Tampa Bay. How would our community be different without him? You know, Craig, I think Monsignor Higgins in a way built had a lot to do with building Tampa, with who we are in this city of Tampa, because he dealt with all the political figures, all the powerful figures, as well as all the children. He brought all of them, he brought them together. It was Monsignor Higgins who could cross bridges that m many people couldn't cross because he was a man of the cloth. He was, I'm independent of all of you people. I can talk to anybody, and he could. John, thank you. You bet. Okay, coming up, we'll map out the looming battles this week in Congress, and we'll show you how they will likely play out, plus insight from former Congressman David Jolly when we come back. Well, today you have an Axel Bank sat down with former Congressman David Jolly of Pinellas County. Some very interesting insight, among other things. The former Congressman explained why he thinks both sides in Washington put politics over people. Take a look. I'm one who would always rather figure out how we work together than to just go home. He's progressive. We're, we're, we're but I think both the White House and the Congress in the past several years has determined the best politics for re-election was to just not do anything. And that's a big gamble. And I think we saw a lot of people on election night realize for some the gamble paid off and for some it didn't. Okay, you can watch the full interview with former Congressman Jolly, Craig Patrick's Money, Power, and Politics on YouTube. Again, click subscribe. You can ask, also catch up on prior shows you may have missed, as well as our investigations of money and politics and our humor and parody segments. Closing seconds here as this week plays out. It will be a busy one. Look for the nominees to pass, but they will get bruised up along the way. Obamacare dismantled, but I think it may be slow walked a bit as well. That's our show, folks. We'll see you tomorrow night.